Well, as we wind down, as we bring our descent into uh, the closure of 1 Thessalonians, it's been a journey in which we've been looking at the model church. We've been looking at uh, the church of first love, a young church, and yet a very vibrant church, a church that was known for its faith, known for its love, and known for its hope. And as we come through the letter, we've seen uh, the wonderful intimacy within the church, between the leaders as well as the sheep. And Paul now comes with final instructions, beginning in verse 12 uh, through 22, and then one of the beautiful benedictions found in the Bible. And in Paul's final instructions, he's dealing with very, the very core of Christianity, and that is relationship. Relationship. And he would write about our relationships with leaders, how we are to esteem and respect the leaders that God has placed over us. He would also then talk about our relationship with one another, sheep on sheep, and exhort us to, uh, to hold them in high esteem and love for one another. And now, as we've been working through, beginning in verse 16 through 22, he deals with our relationship with God. And he drives the Thessalonians to understand that their relationship with God, their living relationship with the triune God, will determine the quality of all their other relationships. And he has, in verse 16 to 22, there are eight commands, eight commands that paint the picture of the Christian life, the whole Christian life. And these eight commands are broken up, first in a group of three, which we are going to finish today, Lord willing. And then he has the remaining eight, the remaining five, I should say, uh, showing us how we are to respond to the work and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. But in his first grouping of three, found in verse 16 and 17, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. If you really want to uh, boil down the Christian life in all its simplicity, this is it. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks. Those are the marks of first love Christians. Those are the mark of a maturing church. And we began by looking at the command, rejoice always. We spent three weeks on that, and I'm not going to go through a lengthy review. But the key point in understanding rejoice always is knowing what joy is. I should say knowing the sources of joy. And when you seek to find the joy of the Lord, remember, you must seek the the giver of the joy more than the joy. And that comes through understanding what it means to abide in Christ, and thus what it means for him to dwell within us, Ephesians chapter 3 and John 15. Today, we are looking at verse 16 and verse 17 and 18, and we want to look at the two other marks of a first love Christian. We want to look at two other of the commands that show the whole Christian living out the whole of the Christian life. And the commands are pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Now, when you read those, I know that there's an immediate feeling overwhelmed. Pray without ceasing? Give thanks in all circumstances? And yet, this is what Paul is giving these Christians by way of final instructions. And when you look at rejoice always and give thanks, the middle command, pray without ceasing, is like the bridge. It's the bridge that links both of those commands. Because what is the primary means by which we rejoice in the Lord? It's prayer. What is the primary means that we give thanks to the Lord? It's the language of prayer. And so, but when you look at prayer, and if we were to sit down and have a conversation about prayer, we could talk a lot about prayer, but I'm not sure that we understand prayer. Is that there's much written on uh, on prayer. I have a shelf of books on prayer, and I look at that, and I said, really? And the context of what prayer is, it's one of the most talked about disciplines in the Christian life. It's one of the most exhorted practices in the Christian life, but it may very well be the most misunderstood discipline in the Christian life. Octavius Winslow said this, quote, there is no religious duty so little understood or more genuinely abused as prayer, end quote. Well, what we're going to do today, and the temptation was very high to launch out on a lengthy series on prayer, but we're not going to do that. That may be for another time. What I want us to do is I want us to come away with a working definition of prayer, and then I want us to look at two types of prayer. Now, that's not restricted. 
But I want us to look at two types of prayer which are essentially uh, together. They have to be together, though they are distinct. Because without both of them, there'll be no obedience to the command to pray without ceasing. And then we want to look at the command in verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. And look at the place of giving thanks as it shapes our prayer lives. Let's begin with the definition of prayer. A definition of prayer. A definition that even the simplest child could understand. Is prayer, in its simplest understanding, is the language of love between the child of God and his or her reconciled Heavenly Father through the Son, empowered and directed by the Spirit. That is just a very simple, workable definition. It is the language of love between the child of God and his or her reconciled Heavenly Father through the Son, empowered and directed by the Spirit. But here's a more thorough one, and I believe uh, it's on your outline. If you don't have an outline, there should be some back there. And if you didn't get one, there is none, and you're not getting on our email list, uh, send a note to the office so we can send these things to you so you'll have them in advance. But on your outline is a definition, which arguably may be one of the best definitions ever penned, and over 300 and some years ago, by John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, the author of Holy War, and about 40 other books. This is what Bunyan defines as prayer. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart or soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit for such things as God has promised or according to his word for the good of the church with submission and faith to the will of God. Now, I realize it's a lot of words, but there's also a lot of depth There is a lot of substance in this understanding of prayer. And I'll just rifle through some of the qualities in this definition that are rooted in Scripture, that are rooted in the biblical models of prayer. First, it's Trinitarian. Is this Trinitarian? Do you understand, do I understand that we pray to the triune God? That there are distinct uh, members of the Trinity comprising of one God by which we commune with? It's Trinitarian. It's transparent. Bunyan would say with sincerity is that we are open before God. There's no hidden things. It's also intelligent. He would say sensible. It's relational. Affectionate pouring out of the heart. It's God-centered on his promises for such things as are promised. It's word-centered according to his word. It's God-centered on its purposes for the good of the church. It's submissive to God's sovereignty with submission to the will of God. And it's confident in faith. I would encourage you to just go through that and and find the verses. Better yet, buy the book and read Bunyan's book on prayer, which will take you to uh, the scripture. But that is a thorough definition of prayer. And the insight that Bunyan gives in this prayer, and the reason why we're spending time in the introduction of this, because we need to understand Uh, at least in some measure, what prayer truly is if we're going to obey the command, pray without ceasing. It's just like rejoice always. I can't just rush into obeying the command rejoice always unless I understand what joy is that fuels rejoicing always. It's the same thing with prayer. I can't exhort you to pray. You know, know, how discouraging is that to be told what to do but not given the tools or the how-to? And so we have to spend time establishing or reacquainting ourselves to what prayer is because there's a lot happening in the church of Jesus Christ today on a broad uh, context and even within us at times that may not meet the standard for what biblical prayer is. Well, the thing about Bunyan's definition which really gripped me was that it encompasses the whole of our being. He's talking about our mind. He's talking about our affections. He's talking about our will. He's talking about the very core of who we are. So prayer, as Paul would say in Corinthians, is I pray in in the spirit, but I also pray with my mind. So there is a, a language here that is intelligent when it comes to prayer. Well, I want to offer some, uh, some, some personal sharing, some pastoral sharing in regards to, you know, what I see in the landscape of Christianity today, as well as some comments about prayer. And the first uh, thing about the landscape of Christianity 
If you, would, if you were to look around, I know you do, and I, and I meet with pastors and we talk, uh, I believe the two greatest needs in the church of Jesus Christ today are number one, revival. The recovery of first love for Jesus Christ. It's a first love that he is Lord of Lord in all areas of our lives. There is an absolute total abandonment and submission to his person. That's the greatest need. And when you have recovery uh, of first love, you have revival. The second great, greatest need, I believe, is in the church today. It is a recovery or even discovery of the biblical models and patterns of prayer. And the question must be asked, do we pray biblically, privately, and corporately? And I want to offer you four comments about that. It's, it's things that I'm keenly aware of in my own life, deficiencies of time in my own life. But I think one of the great dangers we face is to think we got something and call it biblical without going to the evidence, without looking at the evidence. Is it biblical? And I would challenge all of us to ask ourselves in our prayer lives. One, does it meet what Bunyan describes, which is rooted in scripture? And number two, is our praying either corporately or privately, does it pass the test of scripture? Does it pass the test of biblical substance and biblical modeling? Well, here's four comments that I would have uh, by way of prayer. Number one, prayer is to be God-centered. It is to be word-driven, spirit-dependent, marked by reverence, the fear of God, and humility. True prayer only occurs in the context of spirit-dependency, God-centeredness, word-driven, gripped with the fear of God, and humility from the one praying. Remember what we read and Gene prayed through, Isaiah 66, and this is the one that I will look upon. He that is what, or she that is what, contrite, broken in spirit, humble, and tremble at my word. That's the criteria for communion with God. And prayer, in its simplest definition, is the love language between a reconciled God. Here's my second comment. Prayer is not us approaching God with words of authority or an attitude of claiming anything. Prayer is not us approaching God with words of authority or attitude of claiming anything. Prayer is a language of glad, childlike submission, recognizing who God is, who we are, and the humbling awareness of His sovereignty over all things. That creates the soil for effective prayer. We find no biblical support to cry out to God that we are claiming something. We cling to promises. Clinging and claiming are not the same. Is that we rest in his promises. But to make bold statements of claiming something doesn't find biblical support. Here's the third thing. So prayer is to be God-centered, word-driven, spirit-dependent. Now, all this is laying the foundation so that we can pray without ceasing. So these are connected, though it may feel like I'm on a trail. It's not a very long trail. Here's a third thing. So prayer is God-centered, word-driven, spirit-dependent, marked by reverence, the fear of God. Prayer is not approaching God claiming anything. It is a humble awareness of who he is and who we are. And when we understand that, then we're going to learn prayer. Thirdly, Prayer is not an opinionated, politicized exercise of informing God of current affairs and directing Him to intervene according to our desires. Now, I know that that might be hard to hear. But let's remember, we don't pray opinionated or politicizing prayer, exercising or informing God of current affairs and directing Him to intervene as we would like. And the reason why that is so, who is orchestrating a current affairs? God. He's not surprised by what's happening in our world. And so let's make sure that we don't reduce prayer down to us actually boldly directing God and politicizing prayer to where we tell him what's happening. And sometimes it's like reading him the newspaper. He doesn't need that. Now, please don't misunderstand me and don't flood my email with disagreements on this. I, what I'm saying is, yes, we intercede for what's happening in the world. But let's understand that the predominant intercession in the Bible in prayer is spiritual and eternal. 
It's not temporal and passing. And that does not mean, as I mentioned, that we don't, we don't pray for our nation. We don't pray for God to have mercy. Let me give you a, a little Bible study. I want you to pray. I want you to read through, maybe even this afternoon. Read the prayers of Nehemiah, chapter 9, Ezra, chapter 9, and Daniel, chapter 9. And you're going to find leaders praying for the nation. And the characteristics of Bible prayer for praying for a nation are marked by God's character the sins of a nation, and the pleas for mercy. That's the context. And so read Nehemiah 9, Ezra 9, and Daniel 9. We cannot use, we cannot use prayer as a means of a means to voice our opinions, to voice the, the, the political arenas that we're in, or voice what's going on in all the world today. There's a lot of things in our world that's causing division among Christians, and we need to stop that. Because you know what that does to us? It distracts us from the gospel. It distracts us from Christ. Now, I am not advocating we pull away from culture. We're to be salt and light, and we have to have a voice in culture. But let's get this very clear. No amount of of physical activism will change a heart. The heart is changed by the Spirit of God with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And any nation that's ever been changed, when you look at Nehemiah, I'm sorry, look at Nineveh. How is Nineveh changed? By the preaching of the word. By a reluctant preacher named Jonah. Who could have cared less about the Ninevites? So let's be very careful. We speak against the evils of our times. And we beg God for mercy because the evil of our times, it's not about us. It's about the offense offense of a God who's holy. The fourth thing I would say about prayer is prayer is to be as natural for the Christian and the church as breathing is for the creature. Hence, praying without uh, without, uh, ceasing. Praying always ceasing. Prayer is to be as natural for the Christian church as breathing for the creature. And when you're born again, there's the natural impulse given by the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of prayer, to pray. What was the very first thing that was said of the Apostle Paul after his conversion? His very first mark of testimony. Behold, he is praying. That was his, that was his first mark of testimony that he was praying. So there's just some personal thoughts on prayer. And if you ever uh, go through and you read church history, you'll see that God has intervened in a nation and God has intervened in, in, for his people when his people give themselves over to prayer. Revivals are always linked to some form of prayer. Well, let's go back to Paul's command. Paul's command. Paul's command to pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing. Now, when you read that, don't misinterpret that. Don't say, well, I guess it's time to, uh, to sell everything and go and become a monk in a mountain somewhere. That's not what he's saying. This is not a retreat to a monastic life of isolation and be on your knees all the time. That's not what this prayer is. But there are times that you must have protracted solitude times of prayer. Jesus made it very clear, when you go to your closet, he didn't say if, he says when you go. So there are times, and he would expect us that we pull away as Christians for a long time with him. Those extended times of prayer. That's an element of praying without ceasing. But to pray without ceasing isn't to just separate yourself from the trenches of the life that you live. To pray without ceasing is to live Here's three things. It's to live in in the awareness of God's presence with a constant dependency upon him and aware that you are in relationship with him, live by faith. That means it's felt sometimes and sometimes it's not. Is that there's this consciousness, to pray without ceasing, ceasing, is this spiritual consciousness of God's presence, of our constant dependency upon him, And that we are in relationship with the triune God who is everywhere as well as near. Turn with me to Psalm 109. Here's a wonderful example from David on what praying, prayer without ceasing looks like. David, the man after God's own heart, uh, would be say it could be said of that of him because he was a man that sought God from his heart. 
He was a man after God's own heart because he sought man, God, God from his heart. When you read the Psalms, you know what you're reading? You're reading the greatest hymn book ever penned, and you're also reading, uh, reading the greatest prayer book ever penned. In fact, I could go this afternoon, take all my books on prayer, throw them out there, and just open up the Psalms. Uh, I'm not going to do that. But the reality of it is, is that you can learn to pray by entering into the prayer lives of David, of Paul, of Jesus, and of other mature Christians. J.C. Ryle said this, you learn to pray by praying. Just make sure you listen to the right models. Because you can also learn how not to pray by listening to others. But look at Psalm 109, verse 1. David is in a very, very difficult place. He is feeling the pressure of accusation. He's feeling uh, slander, gossip. Uh, it's, it's venomous. Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. So he's feeling this being, being pressured in, this, this sense of being overwhelmed uh, by attacks of people, verbally attacks mainly. Notice his response. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I... Most translations read, but I give myself to prayer. That's not the most accurate. In fact, the Hebrew, uh, tr the Hebrew is the strongest. It's very emphatic. This is how it really reads. But I am prayer. Notice the difference. He says, I am prayer. I don't just pray. I am prayer. What, is that? what does that mean? Well, Dr. James Boyce said this. It means that I am all prayer or characterized by pray. I am praying to God always. Augustus Toplady said a Christian is all over prayer. He prays at rising, at lying down, and as he walks. So then to pray without ceasing is to walk every day, no matter the busyness of life, no matter what we're enc in encountering, is that you're living in that conscious awareness not always felt, but a conscious awareness of the mind, of the heart, that you are in the presence of God, that you constantly need him, thus you commune with him, and in doing so, you find like Enoch, you walk with God every day. I realize that, said, that may not help you in some ways. You may say, well, what does that really look like? What it looks like is you learn, and I learn, to be so controlled by the scripture, which we said last week, so controlled by the scripture, that I'm constantly in a sense of awareness of who God is because of the spirit prompting my heart and my mind by the word that is within me. That's not idealistic. We are told, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. I have put your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's this awareness of being controlled by his word, which will always prompt prayer. Remember the storyline of, of the scripture? Remember from Genesis to Revelation, what's the storyline? God with his people. God wanting communion with his people. And how is the primary means of communion that we have? God-centered, word-driven, spirit-dependent prayer. So those are, that's kind of the intro when it looks at the definition and understanding a little what it means to pray without ceasings. You say, well, this is kind of foreign to me. I have times of prayer, but I'm not walking with a constant awareness. I'm not, I'm not trying to create a false piety here. But we should be able to wake up. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We should be able to walk outside and see a sunset and say... The heavens declare your glory. I just gave you two examples how the word of God can prompt you to praise, can prompt you to rejoice. And the more that the word of God controls us, the more that we'll seek to know the God of the word. Now let's take a look. I want to give you two types of prayer which helps us to uh, build on this foundation of praying without ceasing. Two types of prayer. Now there are many more. But as I thought this through in my own life and, I, and, and see the application, these are critical to understand. There are two main types of prayer that the Christian practices in relationship with God. The first one is, um, we may call this petitionary. And by virtue of the root word petition, it's us asking. It's us asking God. Now, I would argue to say that if we were to sit down and we balanced out our, on a scale our prayer lives, how much of it is petitionary and how much is it the second type we're going to look at today, relational. I would probably say it's pretty heavy 
tipped to the petition side, right? I mean, look at your press, uh, look at your uh, your prayer life recently. Has it been heavily slanted on you asking God to do something, or are you asking God to give something, or has it been balanced and even tipped to where you just want to be in the presence of God? I just want to know you. I just want to adore you. That's an element of prayer and the second type, the relational prayer, and we'll look at that. Turn with you to Matthew chapter 6. This is the model prayer that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the first type of prayer that we mention. Petitionary prayer, petitionary prayer. Now, the reason why uh, we're giving both of these, because you have to have both. If your prayer life is all petitions, it becomes mechanical and formulaic. If all you're doing is asking, asking, and asking, then all you're going to do is deaden the spiritual life, and you're going to find yourself inconsistent. And what do you do when he doesn't answer it the way you want to? If you don't have the relationship to fall back on, you'll probably get angry. So petitionary prayer all of it by itself will produce a mechanical, formulaic prayer life. On the other side, if you, if you just stress relationship, 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 you, know, you can get in bad, subjective places outside the guardrails of the Scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. You know this quite well. Jesus giving the model prayer. His prayer, the Lord's prayer is John 17. But this recognizes the Lord's prayer. It's actually the model Lord's prayer, how to pray. He says, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven. Now, note how he starts. He starts relationally. He starts from a family position. So he immediately, we see the marriage between petitionary and relational. He didn't say, oh, God of unknown or all that flowery stuff that sometimes you can read. People read prayers. Remember 9-11 and you heard some of those prayers that were being read in public? They were lifeless. Oh, God of this, this flowery language. And I'm not saying all of them were like that, but you've been in religious settings where there's been prayers that are read that are absolutely without spirituality. Jesus is telling us that we pray to a God we know. And he's a father. Remember the definition? The simple, we are praying to a reconciled father through the son by the spirit. And so Jesus then, he links it, but let's go on. Who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This prayer is heavy on petition. Heavy on petition. At, not at the expense of relationship. But this is the classic petitionary prayer. And I want you to understand something. When you look at these petitions, know where they start first. It's all about God's honor. It's all about God's glory. It's all about God's will. His petitions are, your kingdom come. Your name be hallowed. Your will be done. All of that prior to us unloading our petitions. It's not like we rush into God and say, Father, thank you. Here, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's not what we're being taught. What we're being taught is our Father. How great is your name? How holy is your name? How sovereign is your will? How great are you? It, that's how prayer begins. And when you get that right, then the proper approaching him with the right petitions unfolds from our lives. I feel sometimes I pray to a God that I claim to know that I know so little of. But now look at these petitions from a humanly perspective in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Do you note that there's only three petitions directed by the human? Now, again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we don't bring all of our our cares. We do. We're told to cast our cares upon him. But do you note here, do you note here that of the three petitions, only one is physical? The other ones are spiritual. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. So in a very real way, Jesus is teaching us, and he also modeled for us, that the spiritual far outweighs the physical. The spiritual far outweighs the physical. 
And when, he, when it comes to the spiritual, first and foremost is God being honored, God being glorified, God being the center of our prayers. And the more that we learn who God is and pray out of who he is, the more that we'll be free from worry, the more that we'll be free from anxiety, the more we'll be free from stress. Why? Because he, he who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, he's able to give us our daily bread. He's able to come alongside and be a very present help in time of trouble. But in this model prayer that Jesus gives us, it's important that we understand that there is a tremendous balance between the spiritual and the physical. And it'll be a good exercise to evaluate our prayer lives, either as a church or as individuals, to pray without ceasing and its only petitionary misses the mark and the point of true prayer. True prayer is relational that contains petitionary. And that leads us to the second type of prayer. If we're going to pray without ceasing, number one, we need the petitionary prayers because it reminds us how dependent we are on God. But we also need the relational type of praying because relationship is what matters. It is the work of redemption. And by the way, we can only pray. Now, you could be an unsaved person and cry out petitions to the God you don't know. And many people do that. You can be a religious person and not be a Christian and pray to a God you don't know and ask for a bunch of stuff. But if you're going to pray the second type of praying that we look at, which will marry, give us the marriage in, uh, in praying without ceasing, then the only way that you can be in relationship with a God who is your God is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. And so if you're here today and you've never embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, and what I mean by that, have you ever come to the point in your life where you see that you are indeed separated from a creator who gave you a holy law that you cannot keep and that you have broken continually and that you owe him a debt that you cannot pay. And that you see on the cross of Christ, not a, an example and not a moral teacher, but you see your substitute. You see him hanging on the cross exclusively for you. And that you run to him with an abandonment. Do you know what salvation, I was in a little study yesterday and we were talking about what does it mean to believe on Jesus. Do you know what it really means to believe on Jesus? It means that you totally abandon everything that you are and everything that you hope to be and your hope of eternity completely on him. And if he fails, you fail. That's what true faith is. True faith is actually throwing yourself at the foot of Christ and said, if you don't save me, I won't be saved. It's not an easy believism. I'm making a decision for Jesus and I'm all good. That's not new birth. New birth is casting your feet at the foot of the cross and saying, have mercy on me, change me, because I can't be changed otherwise. And when that starts, when that happens, welcome to relational prayer. Then you're able to pray, Father. Why? Because the Son has revealed the Father to you, and the Spirit has impressed upon you and given you new birth, where you can cry out of the depths of your pain, Abba. Abba, Father. What's a prime example of this relational prayer that we are to have in conjunction with petitionary? Look at Psalm 23, one of the most famous, if not the most famous psalm that we have. Do you know what Psalm 23 is? I may not think it is, but like most of the Psalms, 20, Psalm 23 is a prayer. It's a prayer. David is praying in Psalm 23. And how do we know that? Well, look at verse 5. Who's he talking to? He's not talking to himself. Now, there are Psalms that he does talk to himself. And the way he does talk to himself in Psalm 42, that's a good way to talk to yourself. In Psalm 42, he says, why are you cast down, O my soul? So in times of depression, in times of discouragement, don't talk to yourself about your depression and discouragement. Reason with yourself and say, well, why? Why am I like this? That's what he does in Psalm 42. Why are you cast down, O my soul? He's not talking to someone else. Now, make sure that you're away from people because they think you're kind of weird if you're talking to yourself like that. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in God. You'll praise him again. That's what he does in Psalm 42. Well, in Psalm 23, he's talking to the Lord. Hence prayer. The language of relationship. Now, let's work through this thing, and, and pretty quickly. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Count how many petitions are there. Zero. There's not a single asking of God for anything. You know what he's doing? He's praying. But he's praying relationally. He's not pray, praying at a petition. He's praying because he knows his God. And he's praying because he knows his God in the intimate relationship of sheep and shepherd, verse 1. He's praying because he knows his God in the pastoral care that the Lord has for him, verses 2 and 3. He's praying in relationship, in verse 4, of the confident companionship he has with the Lord. He's praying out of relationship, in verse 5, for the sure protection and provision that the Lord has given to him. And he's praying, in verse 6, out of a relationship because of the assurance of favor that he has and he will have forever. What a model prayer in Psalm 23. Yes, we run to this for comfort in, in hard times, but have you run to this as a model of relationship with your God? Even to pray this way? When's the last time that you, when's the last time that I've got alone with God and all I want to do is to praise Him and to exalt Him for all He is to me and all He's done for me without a single petition? I would challenge us. Try to pray, and let's just take something uh, that's, that's doable. Try to pray for 10 minutes and not ask God for anything. Yeah. That was a word. Think about it. Try to, try to go to a prayer meeting. We've done this on Saturday morning men's prayer where we've let, we've entered and said, listen, we are not going to ask God for a single thing. We are going to spend an amount of time simply to praise God for who he is. You know how hard that is? But do you know, I can tell you by personal experience, I've sat in those prayer meetings on Saturday morning, and the tone and the spirit of those prayer meetings have shifted drastically when we take our eyes off our petitions and we put up on the God who is. So Psalm 23, try it. I'm not saying test the Lord, but try this. This is a prime example of relational prayer. Where are the petitions? There are none. There are none. But I also want you to look at um, Psalm 18, 18, because I want, I want us to see that it's not either or. To pray without ceasing in obedience to that command, you have to have petitions because we're a dependent creature. That's what we're dependent. We're, we're created for that. And God delights in giving to his children. Remember what Jesus said? He said, ask and you shall receive. So we are called to be a petitionary people. God delights in answering our prayers. However, don't you think he delights even more so in us wanting his presence? In us wanting to be in his presence? There's a direct correlation between obeying the great command and our prayer lives. Have you thought about that? Is it prayer if it's a language of love? Then my expression and even practice of love for God is directly tied to my prayer life. Thomas Manton, one of the 17th century Puritans, he said this, quote, the fruit of prayer increases love, end quote. The more that you come to seek God, not just as the genie or the put the petition in the slot, pull the lever and wait for it, the more that you come to God because you desire the relationship and that's because of new birth and every Christian, every genuine Christian is born again. He gives you the desire for him. The Christian who has drifted away has no desire for God. One of two things. Either you're severely backsliding or you're not a Christian. Because the Spirit of God gives us this hunger to know him which will prompt us to pray to seek his presence. And I realize that it, it isn't perfected. It's not about your words. It's about the beat of your heart. It's about the beat of your heart for him. And in a very real way, for us to say, I love you, Lord, will be verified by our prayer life. And not just petitionary, but relationally. Psalm 116. I told you to go to Psalm 18. Uh, stay there, but in Psalm 116, this is how it opens up. A prayer, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. You see, there's a marriage there. 
prayer and love. So a prayerless Christian, and, and this, is, this, is very, this is hard to take, I realize, because it's hard for, for me to understand myself, and because of the indictment. In a very real sense, as we pray, how we pray, so we love. How we pray, as we pray, even the frequency of our prayer life, petitionary and relationally, so we love. If prayer is the language of love between a reconciled creator and his child, and if it is the language of communication, to neglect the communication sends a message of lack of love. Psalm 18, verse 1. This is a beautiful picture that David gives us. Of the, uh, of the interwoven nature of petitionary prayer and relational prayer. David is in great distress in Psalm 18. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's one of my favorite psalms, and I, and I would encourage you to spend a lot of time in this psalm. It talks about warfare. It talks about God's delight in us. There's so much, but I want us to look at the first six verses, not expositionally, but somewhat devotionally. And as you look through this, David is in great distress. But what does he do? He anchors his prayer life in the relationship. Because in the relationship, as he gets to know more and more, and he proclaims and even convinces himself who God is, what rises within him? Confidence. The more that I know who this God is, and the more that I seek him relationally, the more that I grow in confidence, and the more that I'm not fearful of what's happening out there. I don't need to be afraid. Why? Because of Psalm 18 and what God has said he is to me in relationship. Now look at verse 18. I'm sorry, 18, 1, and 1 through 6. And look at the balance between David's sharing of his heart relationally, David proclaiming who God is to him and what he is to him, and David's petitions. I love you, O oh Lord, my strength. I can imagine, and I'm not saying this with levity, I can imagine the heart of God hearing his child being able to say that to him with sincerity. To be able to look up to heaven and say, I love you, Lord, and, and you know that I do. You know there's no hypocrisy. There's no, there, you know I'm not harboring anything. You know I'm not uh, uh, masquerading. You know all that. I love you, Lord. And then, let's go on. And, and what does he say that God is about, God is to him, and what does God do for him? O oh Lord, so I love you, O oh Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock. David goes on and on and on, and one of the most important words in those verses is the possess of my. This God is David's God, my God. And he's praying because he's his rock, his fortress, his deliverer, his refuge, his shield, his salvation, his stronghold. And then in verse 3, what does he do because of all that? I call upon the Lord. I pray. And I will be saved from mine enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death comforted me. In my distress, what did he do? He didn't hoe up in a corner or isolate himself and say, woe is me. He said, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. Why would he do that? Because of verse 1 and 2. He was convinced that God was his rock. It was his fortress. It was his deliverer. He was his God. He was his shield. He was his salvation. He was his stronghold. He prays out of confidence of relationship. And if we're going to praise without ceasing, we have to pray out of relationship. Relationship that contains petitions. But petitions alone doesn't build relationships. And if your prayer life isn't growing in relationship, it will soon die. Or it will become simply just a mechanical thing that you do, and you'll neglect it. Because there's no encounters with the living God. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. And we're going to move on to the last command. So how do we pray without ceasing? One, the awareness of God is near. Number two, the awareness of our dependency upon him and everything. Do you realize that you are here today solely because of the mercy of God that gave you breath and got you out of bed? 
you were here today and did not have a car accident out of the mercy of God. You are sitting here right now with the intelligence and the ability to hear the word of God solely out of the mercy of God. There's nothing we have in our lives. There's no such thing as a self-made person. Every single thing that we have and are are by the grace of God. Everything. That doesn't dismiss work ethic. It doesn't dismiss you know, doing your best. And that leads to the third command. Look at verse 18 in 1 Thessalonians 5. So the, tri, the, the triune um, commands that encompass the healthy Christian, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and then we have the command giving thanks. I don't struggle so much with those first two. It's the next three that's tough in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. So where does the place of giving thanks fit in prayer? Well, if prayer is the bridge or if prayer is the chain that links rejoice always and giving thanks, and it is, where does thanksgiving fit in prayer? If you were to do a study of thanks, thanksgiving, just in the Psalms alone, 16% of the Psalms have the command, give thanks. 16%. That's pretty high. If you move into the New Testament, from the Gospels to the Revelation, the appearance in its various uh, um, renditions, giving thanks or thanksgiving as a command appears in over 40% of the New Testament. That's a pretty big deal, which makes it a very big issue with our God. Jesus himself practiced this. We find in Matthew, John, and Luke, our Lord Jesus in prayer. And this is how he started out his prayer. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. John eleven forty one. 41. So they took away the stone, Lazarus. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. Luke 10, 21. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father. Now that's a very important, a very important connection Jesus makes. If the incarnate God, the Son of God himself, practiced thanksgiving in prayer, how much more so redeemed children? How much more so us? And and I would challenge you, and I'm going to give you one challenge before we leave, is I want to give you another challenge here. Look back over your life the past seven days. Was it marked by thanksgiving? Give thanks in all circumstances. Yeah, even when the bottom falls out. Even when something goes south that you were not prepared for. We live in a very uncertain world to the world, but not to us. Is it not fitting that we would give thanks for the God of all grace and all mercy, who by his grace and mercy, you are sitting here right now? But I want you to look at Ephesians chapter Five. We have two more passages to look at. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Here's the importance. Remember what Jesus said? Uh, Luke records that Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And because he's rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, the command, rejoice always. He said, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. What does Jesus model for us? There's a lot out there that claims to be of the Spirit of God, which I don't believe is of the Spirit of God. You know, one of the evidences that you, uh, that you are filled with the Spirit, it isn't some, some sign, it isn't some gift. You know, one of the uh, clearest signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit and controlled by the Spirit of God, it's by giving thanks. God does extraordinary things through ordinary means. Let's be careful that we don't look for something big when he does things in a smaller way. For instance, don't try to figure out, am I filled with the Spirit? Ask yourself this, am I living in a a spirit of thanksgiving? Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And now, here he comes. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. 19 uh, through 20 gives us the the answer to verse 18. But be filled with the Spirit. What does that look like? Verse 19, address one another in psalms and hymns, worship, 
singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul would go on in verse 21 and give the other marks of a spirit-filled person. But for our purposes today, if we want to obey the command, give thanks in all things, then prayer must be connected to that to where we truly practice a life of giving thanks in all things. Alexander Witt was a well-known preacher in the 19th century in Edinburgh. He was very famous for his pulpit prayers. He prayed with power. I believe there is a gift of prayer, and he, he definitely, evidently had it. Alexander always found something to thank God for, even in bad times. One stormy morning, a member of his congregation, who was one of those grouchy members, he thought to himself, the preacher will have nothing to thank God on such a wretched morning like this. He comes into church eager to hear the prayer from his pastor. White began his prayer like this. We thank thee, God, that it's not always like this. What a perspective of thanksgiving. Then there was Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry wrote one of the great books on prayer. Matthew Henry was attacked by thieves, and he was robbed. He wrote these words in his diary. Let me be thankful first, because I've never been robbed before. Second, because all they took was my purse. They did not take my life. Third, because all they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. What a perspective. They didn't get much. They didn't take my life. I have a lot to be thankful for, even though I was, I was robbed. Well, here's a final, final uh, text I want us to look at. We'll close with this. Luke chapter 17, verse 11 and 19. And here's your, here's your open life test. If we're going to obey the command to pray without ceasing, it must include a regular practice of giving thanks in all circumstances. By nature, if you're not a Christian, it is not your nature to give thanks. The DNA of the unsaved is selfishness. It's all about me. Well, as Christians, we're not eradicated from that. And we can easily fall prey to it's all about me too. So the Christian, though, is more accountable because they know. They know that we are to live in a spirit of thanksgiving. And it's not easy. We are not bent towards that. The spirit of thanksgiving comes from the spirit of God. But take a look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 11. And I want to ask you the question, which group would you be in? Which group would you be in? How you answer that will say a lot about your prayer life and about you, uh, you giving thanks in all circumstances. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 leopards who stood at a distance. And he lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Every one of them received an undeserved act of grace. Every one of them. Just like us. Then one of them, one, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Which, which group would you be in? Would you be in the nine just marching down, taking for granted that God has done a great work in your life? Which, by the way, if you're a Christian, he's done the greatest work ever. Are you in the nine unthankful? Or are we in the one? that would turn back and give thanks. And you know what? Look at, look at verse 18. I want to close with this. Was not one found to return and give praise to God? Do you see what Jesus does? He equates praise and worship to the giving of thanks. The man came back, fell on his face, gave thanks to the Lord, and the Lord says, wasn't there anyone else come back to give me praise? So there is a direct correlation between worship, praise, and giving of thanks, just like we saw in Ephesians chapter 5. So, as we move on in these instructions to Paul, he has defined for us what a healthy Christian looks like. They rejoice always. 
They pray without ceasing, and they give thanks in all circumstances. That's only a work that new birth can do. And so if you're not a Christian, and you're trying to leave here, trying to obey those, you know, see me, please, because I want to save you a lot of time and pain. You can't do it. But by the power of new birth, and you coming to the point where Jesus Christ is your only hope, and you abandon yourself to him, you're going to be able to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. And Christian, if this isn't marking you, then ask God why. Let him reveal to you where worldliness, where things have drifted you away from Christ. He'll restore you. Why? Because he created you for relationship. He recreated you so that you would enjoy rejoicing in him, praying to him, and giving thanks to him. May God help us. Let's pray.